So let me start. What I'm going to talk to you about today is a molecule, a protein molecule called the epidermal growth factor receptor, which is important for two reasons. One, it's a critical molecule in the transmission of information from one cell to another in an animal. So it's one of the molecules that allows an animal to maintain harmony between all its cells. Now that very fact that the protein is required to maintain harmony uh, between cells means that when it is mutated or doesn't function properly, it can lead to uncontrolled growth or cancer. And so the EGF receptor is famous not just for its function in biology, but also its malfunction in cancers such as lung cancer. The EGF receptor is one of many proteins that uh, are involved in the transmission of signals from the outside uh, a cell to the inside of the cell, and then the conversion of that signal into some action on the part of the cell. And so these cell signaling proteins, because they're so important for maintaining balance, are often mutated, uh, are the ones that are often mutated in cancer where they, where they go wrong. There are many different kinds of cell signaling proteins, as you might imagine, but uh, today I'm going to focus just on uh, one particular protein, the epidermal growth factor receptor, and it's a transmembrane receptor. So it's one of a diversity of proteins that are present in the cell that sit on the cell surface and are able to bind to messenger molecules. These could be hormones or growth factors. These are proteins that are coming from one cell and are detected by a receptor on the primary cell. So uh, here, for example, is a schematic diagram showing a receptor in red sitting on the cell surface, but it's specifically activated by the ligand. We call it a ligand. It could be a growth factor or a hormone uh, that, it, that fits into the binding pocket on the surface of the receptor. And this activation then triggers some chemical activity inside the cell. And the class of proteins I'm going to talk about today are the receptor tyrosine kinases, where this activity that is switched on is an enzymatic activity uh, that takes a phosphate group from the energy molecule ATP and transfers that phosphate group to another molecule, another protein. And the presence of this phosphate group doesn't, it's not used here for the generation of force as it is in motors, but here, it's simply used as a chemical signal that says something's happened, something's changed. And that's detected by other proteins that bind to the phosphotyrosine and then do something. So our question or my question has been, how does information transit from outside the cell to the inside during this process of signal transduction by receptor tyrosine kinases? Now, receptor tyrosine kinases are only one of several different kinds of cell surface receptors. So for example, we have ion channels that can be activated by a diversity of molecules. Some of them are neuronal signaling molecules, some of them are meta meta metabolic signaling molecules. And so these signaling molecules, they may be small molecules, they may be proteins bind to the extracellular portion of the ion channel and open the ion channel, which causes a current to flow. They're the famous G protein coupled receptors or G, GPCRs that are the biggest class of drug target molecules in the cell. And they contain seven or more transmembrane helices. And they have extracellular portions that also uh, are not shown in detail here, but they also bind to ligands. And then their structure changes and they, they generate a signal inside the cell. And then there are the receptor tyrosine kinases of which the EGF receptor is one example. And the receptor tyrosine kinases differ from the other two classes of receptors in that they only have one transmembrane segment. So proteins cross the membrane using a structure called a helix, specifically an alpha helix. And this one has only one alpha helix, which you can think of as a cylinder crossing the membrane, whereas these others have several, seven or more. And one of the consequences for that has been that we have now obtained as a field uh, very high resolution images, first using X-ray crystallography and second using cryo-electron microscopy of what these ion channels and GPCRs look like in their intact form in the cell. 
So the understanding of how the ion channels and the GPCR switch on and off uh, is quite deep now. This situation contrasts markedly with the receptor tyrosine kinases, for which there is no image, no structural atomic level image of the intact receptor, including all the pieces I've sketched here. And the reason for that turns out to be quite simple. There's the single alpha helix spanning the membrane and the connections between the transmembrane helix and the parts that are outside and inside are rather flexible. And so, and this is going to be a theme of, of what I'm going to say later. And so, in order to be imaged either by X-ray crystallography or by cryo EM, uh, thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of molecules have to be uh, averaged and imaged. That's how the image is generated. And if there's segmental mobility where the parts are not rigidly held with respect to each other, they get blurred out. And I'm gonna show you this. And that's a fundamental reason where so far we don't have uh, structures of intact uh, receptor tyrosine kinases. And so that has raised some questions. I'm gonna just look at one today about how the binding of a hormone shown here in violet um, outside the cell results in the switching on of the kinase inside the cell. So that's, that's the question. And the reason this question is very important is not just because uh, we are interested in how things work. I mean, for me, that is a primary motivation. How do things work? How can we understand a mechanism? But also because, as I said earlier, these things are mutated. The receptor tyrosine kinases are mutated in many cancers. And we need to understand how the mutation affects the activity in order to precisely target the cancer molecule. And so the EGF receptor has a unit inside the cell, which is shown here, a protein domain that's called a kinase domain. And it's the part that does the work uh, of, of transferring phosphate. So you can see the molecule ATP here. The phosphates are in reddish color, it has three phosphates. As, as, as I'm sure you know, and, and the third phosphate is transferred to another protein shown here in green. And so that is the essential working part of, a, of any of the 500 kinases in our genome. And the EGF receptor has one such. And as I said, in cancer, what happens is that the control mechanisms that keep the kinase activity off until a signal is received are disrupted. And this has been understood in great detail over the last two decades. And what I'm showing you here is an image generated in my lab of a drug developed by Novartis called Gleevec. And Gleevec is shown in green and Gleevec is targeting um, the kinase domain of another tyrosine kinase, not the EGF receptor, called the Abelson leukemia virus tyrosine kinase. This happens to be the first example of uh, the precise targeting of a mutant form of an oncogene protein. And this drug has been very successful in the clinic. Now, there are two issues. This lecture I'm giving today is not about how these drugs are developed, but rather about understanding how these kinases switch on and off. And there are two issues that are raised uh, immediately in the development of such drugs. One of them is that developing these precisely targeted inhibitors involves understanding how the proteins switch on and off, because you need to be able to jam the work specifically for one kinase and not another. And so an enormous amount of effort goes into understanding how is the switching mechanism going on and off so we can target the appropriate state of the system. Another problem, and a very, very serious problem, and it's, it's really a very sad situation, and that is that as soon as a human takes one of these drugs, in some cases, within weeks of taking the drug, the body, the cancer cells respond with mutations that cause resistance to the drug. And so it's an ongoing battle between um, the development of a new drug, the acquisition of resistance, and then the modification of drugs. And all of this require a, a fundamental understanding of how these proteins work. And so with that, that's all I'm gonna say about drug development today. And I'm going to now switch to trying to share with you what we understand about how receptor tyrosine kinases in general and the EGF receptor particularly switches on and off. So the first puzzle that confronts us when we look at uh, receptor tyrosine kinases is that there are many of these in our body. 
there are 60 human receptors and these are grouped into a smaller number of families. For example, the EGF receptor shown here on the left schematically is, a, is one of four uh, members of a family that are called HER1, HER2, HER3, HER4. Some of these names are familiar to anybody who's looked at the etiology of say breast cancer. Now, if you look at these receptor tyrosine kinases, what's startling here is that the extracellular portions are all different. They're hugely different. In fact, there is a very interesting uh, evolutionary story here, which I'll just mention very briefly, uh, because what's interesting is that it was discovered that at the base of the metazoan evolutionary tree, that is the evolutionary tree that led to the diversity of animals we have here, at the very root of this tree, before animals, the metazoans actually emerged, there were far more receptor tyrosine kinases in that hypothetical ancestral cell. This is information derived from sequencing organisms like coenoflagellates. In fact, coenoflagellates have hundreds of, have hundreds of tyrosine kinase receptors, far more than humans. And none of them, except for maybe one, has any similarity to the extracellular domains, their, their receptor tyrosine kinases for the transmembrane and intracellular part. And so it looks like evolution, when it went down the animal lineage, tried out many different kinds of ligand binding domains and then abandoned a whole lot of them and kept the ones that we have here in humans, human and animal current vertebrate systems. So if these receptor ligand binding domains are also different, how, how does the receptor switch on? How, how does it understand that a ligand has bound? I mean, the mechanism uh, must be different for every um, receptor tyrosine kinase. So it turns out actually in essence, the mechanism is probably the same in essence for all receptor tyrosine kinases. And one of the clues to this comes from a, the realization that in certain cancers such as glioblastoma, what happens is, that the extracellular domain of the EGF receptor is either deleted completely or partially. And when you do that, the truncated form of the receptor that's shown on the right is extremely active. So this truncated form is actually signaling more strongly than EGF receptor does when it binds to EGF. And so that immediately tells us that in fact, the transmembrane and kinase domains of these receptor tyrosine kinases are perfectly capable of switching on and signaling strongly on their own. And in fact, one way to think about it is that the extracellular domain acts as a break on the kinase and the binding of the ligand releases that break and lets the transmembrane and kinase domains do what they're perfectly capable of doing. So that's one way to look at it. All these diversity of extracellular domains are just inhibitory or repressive modules. And the ligand's job is to just get them out of the way so that the transmembrane and kinase domains can signal. And so that leads uh, to this idea, uh, which we can credit to Yossi Schlesinger and Yossi Arden, uh, that the fundamental mechanism for the activation of most receptor tyrosine kinases is, or maybe all, is either dimerization or alteration of a dimer. And so what happens is that what the ligand does is it converts the extracellular module from a shape that doesn't permit dimerization, not shown in the schematic diagram, to one that permits dimerization. And when the kinase dimerizes, it, it just it's, it has a principal component of dimerization just coming from the transmembrane and uh, uh, intracellular modules. Now, there are different details when you look at different families of receptor tyrosine kinases. For the epidermal growth factor receptor, one of the kinases in a dimer actually acts on the other one and turns it on through a mechanism we call allosteri. These details don't matter for today. It's just that when you form a dimer, it's the parts of the receptor that are inside the cell that are really important for this dimerization. And one of the key things is that they throw a phosphorylation switch. Uh, here is a receptor tyrosine kinase molecule. And what you can see here is that one of the tyrosine residues in this molecule has been phosphorylated in the active state of the receptor, which is shown here. So these receptors turn on 
they gain the ability to transfer phosphate, they add a phosphate onto themselves, the addition of a phosphate onto themselves chemically locks the system in the on state and then it's generating signals. And so that's a, a, a really simple, but in essence, I think correct, correct mechanism for how receptor kinase, tyrosine kinases switch on. And if you look at it from this perspective, you don't really even need to understand the details of the full length receptor. Because all you need to know, and we know this from lots of structural analysis, all you need to know is that without the ligand, say EGF, the extracellular portion of the receptor cannot dimerize, and then the ligand changes its shape to, so that it dimerizes. Now, there are some exceptions to this which don't actually break the rules, such as insulin receptor, which is always a dimer. And there, the insulin molecule is just rotating the dimer into uh, competent and incompetent states for catalysis. And so our current understanding of the uh, receptor is pieced together. As I said, for no receptor do we have an image of the intact molecule, but it's pieced together from the work of many laboratories in many countries. And using X-ray crystallography, uh, we have this understanding of the structure of the dimeric epidermal growth factor receptor. So here's EGF, the ligand bound to it, and this is the beautiful dimeric symmetrical form. Then for the transmembrane helices, we have NMR structures, some from my group, but principally from a group in Russia, of Bokharov et al. And for the intracellular module, we have structures from many labs, including my group, as to how the kinases interact. So this is our understanding of the mechanism, the structure and the mechanism of receptor tyrosine kinases before the new work that I'm going to talk about now. And um, at this point, I might just pause briefly. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult. I find teaching on Zoom, lecturing on Zoom, because you cannot tell whether the audience has fallen asleep, is eating dinner, is watching YouTube, or is greatly interested in what you're saying. So, so I, it doesn't matter, uh, but I will pause and just ask, is there any question I can answer at this stage? Shashi, do you have a question? I see you. No, no, I just wanted to show my face just to say that. <laughs> okay. Yet. All right. Is this moving at the right level or is have I left uh, everybody uh, No, no, it's, no, I think behind. It's, it's perfect. I think, uh, you know, I think you made it uh, very simple for even undergraduate students. Okay. Well, I hope uh, that's okay. I do have a name, a, a hand up uh, from Rama. <laughs> Uh, Rama, hi. Yeah, hi. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is just uh, to ask you, I don't understand wh why is, you mentioned that it has a single kinase, a uh, single alpha helix, transmembrane alpha helix. Why does it make it difficult to, to get the okay. structure of No, no, I'd, lo I'd love to understand that. So uh, to understand it, you have to go back uh, to photography at the end of the 19th century. I'll just use that analogy. So, you know, you know, um, people in photographs in the 19th century, if you ever look at them, have these bizarre expressions. First of all, they don't smile. T typically, they don't smile. Right? And the reason they don't smile is that the photographer had to take an exposure of, say, two minutes. And you have to keep perfectly still while the photograph is being taken because it will average out everything, any motion over two minutes. So you can't hold a smile for two minutes. So that's why in 19th century photographs, it's not that people were greatly unhappy in the 19th century. It was just, they were told, don't move even a muscle in your face. So they sit like this. And that's what the 19th century pictures look like. And the reason for that, if you want to think about it, is that they're averaging over many, many, many moments in time. And so molecular imaging uh, methods also do that. They average over time or they average over molecules. And so if your molecules are intrinsically sitting still, you'll get a beautiful image. But if the top part of the molecule, and I'm going to show you this, so it's good you ask this question because this is a key thing to what follows. If the top part of the molecule is wobbling with respect to the bottom part, then it would be like a 19th century photographer, you know, taking a photograph of a child. 
And so probably the very few photographs of little babies, you know, from the 19th century, because they're probably just, they'd just be a blur. You wouldn't see it. So that's, that's the reason. Okay, so it's not to do with the fact that there's a single helix? Or is it because of the single helix? No, it is a single helix. No, it has to do... The, no, good, good point. So what's, what's not, with the single helix? They're not going to have answers. They're not going to have answers. No, so it has... The reason the single helix is important, I say, imagine a GPCR. So I, I think this is... Uh, you know, it's an important thing. So I, I will just... So let's go back to this diagram. So imagine uh, the ligand-gated ion channel or the GPCR. So you could have the top part of the ligand-gated channel wobbling with respect to the middle part. And then, you know, you wouldn't be able to see, actually, that's not true, they don't wobble that much, but even if they did, you wouldn't be, if they did, you wouldn't be able to get a picture of the whole thing. But because the part in the middle of the membrane is substantial, you can image that even if you don't get the parts that are outside. When you come down to something that just has a single, so the other thing with imaging by say cryo electron microscopy and also X-ray crystallography is that you can't um, necessarily image a single helix. It just doesn't have enough mass for cryo EM to be imaged. It needs to be seen in the context of other things that'll help align the pictures. And this is a great thing to think about because it really gets at some technical things. So let's say I'm moving around like this. So why don't, why doesn't the photographer just take a bunch of frames and then average, you know, align each frame on my arm. Doesn't matter. Everything else would be wobbled, but my arm would then be imaged in detail. But the reason the photographer can't do that is that in any image, if, if my arm is very small, it's just difficult to see it. So, so that's to, to align it. So, so, you know, these are some fundamental reasons why these receptor tyrosine kinases have not yet been imaged, but that will change. And one of the reasons it'll change is that the technology is advancing rapidly. I'm not a technical expert in cryo EM, but it is advancing rapidly. That would be the equivalent, metaphorically speaking, of the cameras getting better and better and better. And also there are other tricks to stabilize molecules. So um, All right. uh, that was Thank a you. That's very- Thank you. Yeah. So let me now go back. You have back. another question from Prabhudha. You have another yeah. question from Prabhudha. Hi. Yes, go ahead. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Kurianma. Uh, yeah. I'm interested in understanding, when you said that no one's made the GFR receptor full length expressed. Uh, no, 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 I didn't. I never, I never said that. Okay. We make it all the time. And I'm going to just show you everything else that's going to follow is going to be for the full length, proper EGF receptor. We make it in mammalian cells, purified. That's not the problem. The problem is in imaging it. Uh, it doesn't sit still. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Was that the question? or Yeah, yeah I, because I was curious because I we do uh, work on a lot of GPCR. So I was curious why I'm- No, no, there's no problem. We, we, we work on many of these proteins and as long as we're doing biochemistry or some functional study, we have no difficulty. I mean, it's a challenging protein, but there's no difficulty. So we have this structure of, of, of the receptor that's on the screen here, but what the point I was making was this is not, um, you know, it's not an image that came from looking at the whole thing, this image came from looking at parts of it to, to and then stitch it together. So, but this understanding of the EGF receptor fails uh, to explain a very simple observation. And that's what the rest of this lecture is going to be about. And that's the observation, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but the EGF receptor, like many of these receptors, have many different hormones growth factors, ligands that can activate them. EGF receptor binds to about seven different ligands. And two of them are shown in this schematic diagram, EGF itself, epidermal growth factor receptor, or transforming growth factor alpha, TGF alpha. They both look very similar, but they're just slightly different in their sequence and their structure. And EGF shown on the left generates a strong signal. At the very end of the lecture, I'll demonstrate that to you and TGF alpha generates a weak signal. And nothing in the simple model I've shown you would explain how the EGF molecule generates a strong signal from this receptor, whereas the same receptor when bound to TGF alpha generates a strong, a weak signal. 
Nothing in the model would be able to explain that because in both cases, they're high affinity ligands. It's not an equilibrium binding situation where one is just not bound as, as much as the other one. They're bound equally, but when bound, they're generating a different output. So what, um, and this, this is my colleague Alana Shepards here at Berkeley has made a lot of insightful uh, discoveries concerning this difference, but I don't have time to talk about her work today. So what Yongjian Huang, uh, a postdoc in my lab did was to work with Sriram Subramaniam who used to be at the, uh, at, at the NIH and is now at the University of British Columbia, who's a fantastic uh, cryo-EM specialist, to image the full length receptor. As I just said, we can purify the full length receptor from human cells, which is what he did, and then purify it, add EGF, and uh, image it by uh, electron microscopy. And this was done. And, and the question I was asked and my answer to it already set up uh, what we see. So here on the left are images of the EGF receptor reconstituted four different ways. Remember that this is a transmembrane uh, protein, so we have to mimic the membrane in some way. In this diagram and on the right, there is actually a lipid bilayer in what's called a nanodisc. So here um, the receptor is imaged in a lipid bilayer. In the other three reconstructions, uh, there are different mimics of a membrane environment. In all of these, you will see that Young Jan can visualize the extracellular module of the EGF receptor, but he cannot see the transmembrane and intracellular module. So this, you might imagine, is a very disappointing outcome. Because if you're trying to understand how the receptor is signaling from outside to inside, and you can't see the transmembrane and inside portions, how, how would you learn anything? And so, uh, this struck us as, as a great setback, but, but I, I do want to point out that this is exactly what you would anticipate. So it wasn't, you know, it's a setback, but I think it's fundamental to the system. And to demonstrate what I mean by it's really what you would expect, I'm going to show you. So here in this red box is the cryo -EM analysis at high contour level or low contour level. And you can just see the, the extracellular module, which we already have a high resolution structure of, is beautifully visualized, uh, but you can't see the transmembrane and kinase domains. Now on the right-hand side, these diagrams are from a computer simulation of the dynamics of the EGF receptor that were done by the DE Shaw group, which have the world's fastest computers for simulating the motions of proteins. This was actually done about eight years ago. And what you can see, here's an instantaneous snapshot from the computer simulation using physics-based calculation of forces and responses. Uh, this is an instant of the EGF receptor in a membrane shown here. And what's shown directly below it is a superposition of instantaneous views of the molecule simulated by computer based on the laws of physics over 20 microseconds, which is a very long time in the life of a molecule, aligned on the extracellular module. And what you can see then is the transmembrane hel uh, helices and the kinase domains just waving in the breeze. This is the segmental mobility uh, that I talked about. Now you can take these simulated structures and you can generate what the cryo-EM density would be from each one and average that. And if you average that, lo and behold, you get a reconstruction now entirely generated by computer that looks just like what we see in the actual experiment that Young Jan carried out with Sriram Subramanian. This doesn't, however, advance us further in understanding outside to inside to just say, well, you know, everything is blurred because everything is segmentally connected. But it turns out that when you look closely at this computer simulation, and I'll just point your attention to the lower right-hand corner, it turns out that the computer simulation was started with the crystal structure of the extracellular domain that was known. And in the simulation based on the laws of physics, Newton's laws applied in a classical simulation of trajectories, there's a conformational change that happens in the receptor. And you can see it by the movement of these orange spheres. The orange spheres represent the junction point of the extracellular module with the transmembrane helices. And in the computer simulation, you can see a systematic, very interesting movement. That's all I'm gonna say about the computer simulations because these movements actually emerged 
from the cryo-EM analysis. So the remarkable advances in cryo-EM have of course allowed us to image particular molecules with great power. But the other remarkable thing is that the way the method works is that millions or hundreds of thousands to millions of molecules are scattered on an EM grid and each individual molecule is in fact visualized. You have to average many of them to get an image. But what Young Jan did was to take his entire data set of about, I've forgotten the number, it was about a million particles, and he binned them into 10 groups that were self-similar and then averaged molecules within those 10 groups. 10 is arbitrary, but what he saw was that in the cryo-EM data, you see a range of structures. And in one extreme, the tips of the extracellular module are close together. This looks very much like the X-ray crystal structure of just the extracellular module. And in the other extreme, these tips are separated. And the separation now is about 25 angstroms. So we have at one extreme a tips juxtaposed conformation, the other extreme a tips separated conformation. And why is this even exciting or interesting? It turns out as soon as we saw this, we were extremely excited because there's a body of work from nuclear magnetic resonance, but it actually tracks back to oncogenic mutations in the epidermal growth factor receptor. And without going into all the history and the details, I want to show you just one diagram from the work of Bakarov and colleagues NMR using nuclear magnetic resonance. So what they did was to study the structure of the EGF receptor transmembrane helices in uh, membrane mimicking environments using nuclear magnetic resonance. And they got two structures. So the rest of the receptor is not, there's no extracellular module, no kinase domain. It's just the transmembrane helices they're imaging. But they got these two structures and I call this the chopstick model for what EGF receptor does. In one, the N-terminal end of the helices, which is close to the outer part of the receptor is touching. And in the other, the C-terminal end is touching in these NMR structures. Now it turns out that these NMR structures had been anticipated by the work of Sarah Fleischmann, Yossi Schlesinger, and Nir Bental, who had looked at the pattern of sequences of the EGF receptor and noted that there are motifs in sequence which correspond to dimerization at the N-terminus and the C-terminus. So they had in fact predicted in advance of this NMR structure that there would be two structures, one crossing at the upper end, one crossing at the lower end. Now, the thing is that we went back and we looked at these structures and we knew that the reasoning in the field is that the N-terminal dimer of transmembrane helices corresponds to the active form. And that's because there are some mutations that activate EGF receptor that lead us to think that the N-terminal crossing is what's, what's the high activity state of the receptor. And we looked at these MR structures and we noticed that the N and C terminal dimers differ in how they separate or bring together the junction points to the extracellular module. No extracellular module here in this NMR structure, but you can see there's a difference in how the junction points are separated in the two structures. Now the NMR structures don't really provide reliable information about these junction points. So we turned to computer simulations, molecular dynamics simulations. This was the work of Deepthi Karandur, who's a postdoc in the lab. And she showed that indeed, if you toggle between an N-terminal dimer of transmembrane helices and a C-terminal dimer of transmembrane helices, what you do because of the structure of the linker to the extracellular module, is that you move the junction points to the extracellular module closer together or further apart. It's really remarkable. So this diagram are physics-based simulations based on the NMR structure. It doesn't know anything about our cryo yet. But what they're doing is showing you that the junction point tends to be about 25 angstroms separated or about eight angstroms separated in these simulations. And you can also do more sophisticated calculations which measure the free energy or the work required to move the junction points further apart or closer together. And if in this diagram, what's shown is that if you have an N-terminal dimer of transmembrane helices, you will have to do work to bring the C-terminal, uh, I'm sorry, the N-terminal junction points to the extracellular domain close together. So the free energy is low at a large separation 
and the free energy goes up as you bring the tips together. So this immediately suggests that there's a coupling between the transmembrane helices, whether they're N-terminally dimerized or C-terminally dimerized, and the structures that young Jan is seeing in the cryo-EM reconstruction. And that when you have the N-terminal dimer, which corresponds, we think, to high activity based on a cancer mutation, it will couple to the structure of the EGF receptor extracellular module where the tips are separated. And on the other hand, when the tips are close together, I don't show you in this diagram, we think it couples to the other structure of transmembrane helices. So this was an exciting idea. And to test this, what Young Jan did was to turn to a cancer mutation. So there is a mutation commonly found in lung, lung cancer patients. It's actually one of the most common point mutations, if not the most common point mutation in EGF receptor. And it's called leucine 834 to arginine or leucine 858 to arginine, depending on the numbering scheme that's used. And we know from a huge amount of biochemical measurements that the introduction of this single point mutation into the kinase domain of EGFR. So this, this mutation is actually in the kinase domain, close to where ATP binds. The single mutation increases the kinase activity of EGFR substantially. In fact, it is an oncogenic mutation. And so what Young Jan did was to prepare this mutant form of EGFR where there's a mutation in the kinase domain and look at it. And so I can tell you what happens is he still doesn't see the transmembrane helix. He still doesn't see the kinase domain. But now the kinase domain, which is in his samples, is mutant. And that mutation has changed the distribution of structures for the extracellular domain. And to show you that, what I show you here is on the top panel, the cryo-EM reconstruction for the tip-separated conformation of EGF receptor mutated. This is the cancer mutation. Two views, I'm sorry, two structures. One of them is what we call tip separated. The other is what we call tips juxtaposed. And that's being compared at the bottom to that of wild type EGF receptor, which I'd already shown you. And there's no difference in the tips together conformation, but there's a clear difference in the tips separated in that this cancer mutation has stabilized, rigidified, the tip separated conformation. So it's visualized much better in the cryo -EM. So that makes us think that when the receptor is mutated, so it's more active, it's favoring or stabilizing the tip separated conformation of the extracellular module. And that led us then to return to the question I had set up is that we have two ligands, EGF and TGF alpha. One generates a strong signal, EGF, one generates a weak signal. TGF alpha. So what Young Jan did was to image the EGF receptor with TGF alpha. Again, no transmembrane helix or kinase domain is visible, but the structures of the extracellular module have changed. And in fact, what TGF alpha shown below does is it destabilizes the tips apart conformation so that the density now is barely visible. In fact, the mobility has increased. Now we actually understand to a good degree of satisfaction what this difference is due to, I'm just not gonna go into it. it, has to do with the shapes of, the, of, of TGF alpha and EGF being slightly different. And those shapes leading to changes in the disposition of the extracellular module. In particular, the only thing I wanna say is that this leg of the receptor is very rigid. And it, it's, it, it's, it, you can think of it as a rigid rod. And because it's connected rigidly to the ligand binding module, when the shape of the receptor changes, that's transmitted into a change in the orientation of this leg here. And that's what underlies this difference. So to summarize what we found then, we conclude, we haven't proven, but we conclude that increased activity, signaling activity from the receptor corresponds to stabilization of the tips separated. Oh, I have a mistake here. Uh, sorry, I won't correct it, but this is the tip separated. All of these are tip separated. It's just the, the density is stronger when you have higher activity. Now, proving this 
requires a lot of experimentation in cells that are expressing the EGF receptor. And we have uh, begun to do that. I'll just show you one experiment. As I mentioned, the rigidity that links the leg of the extracellular module to the ligand binding head, we believe is what's transmitting the shape of the ligand, EGF or TGF alpha, to the transmembrane helices. And so Young Chen identified a tryptophan residue that if you look at the structure, seems to be critical for maintaining rigidity in the coupling to the ligand binding head, between the ligand binding head and this leg. And so he mutated the tryptophan to various residues. The strongest effect is with glycine. And so what you can see in these uh, diagrams here are what we call Western blots. They're just detecting phosphorylation in cells. So these are experiments done in live cells. And one of the things that the EGF receptor does is to activate a pathway called the RAS MAP kinase ERK pathway. This is perhaps the most important signaling pathway that is switched on by the EGF receptor. And so at the top uh, diagram here showing is the phosphorylation of the kinase called ERK. And switching on the EGF receptor switches on ERK phosphorylation, and that's being detected. And then for the wild type enzyme, you will see that the EGF receptor, when triggered by EGF, generates strong phosphorylation of ERK. But when triggered by the same amount of TGF alpha, it generates weak phosphorylation work. So this is a demonstration of that biased signaling that I had mentioned to you earlier. And if you make this single point mutation in the extracellular module of the receptor, that difference is diminished. And the receptor is no longer able to clearly differentiate between the two outputs. And so this is something that supports the idea that uh, the biased agonism is coming from coupling to different toggle states of the receptor, where the transmembrane helices have preferred ways of dimerizing. It's a hypothesis, not directly proven yet. And that difference in the ways of dimerizing couples to differences in whether the kinase domains are permitted to interact in the activating manner, or whether the activating manner of interaction is disfavored. And uh, so I'll leave you with that thought. And uh, with that end, uh, and thank in particular, Young Jian Huang, who is the, he was first a graduate student in the lab and then stayed on as a postdoc. And Deepthi Karnder, who's a postdoc and did the computer simulations. This has all been a wonderful collaboration with Sriram Subramaniam, who's the cryo EM expert, I'm not. And Alana Shepards, my colleague at Berkeley, who's studying the transmembrane helix and how it communicates to the kinase domain, and Jay Groves, um, who does single molecule spectroscopies, and I didn't discuss the work we're doing with him. Okay, with that, I will end. And if there are any, oh, I see a hand raised. So Shashi, do you have a? Yeah, great, you know, fantastic talk. Uh, you uh, could have gone for another hour, I guess. <laughs> Very nice. So I would, you know, two questions. One is related to this kinase mutation. Would that also make uh, your TGF alpha bindings giving it a stronger signal? Or is only yeah. Sort of I mean, I think we haven't. Uh, the prediction is yes. I can't yeah. remember standing here at the moment whether that experiment is done. Uh, I would say absolutely that my prediction would be that the mutation in the kinase domain would bypass control from the extracellular domain. It, it just, it stabilizes the on state a lot. And so, you know, then this, this bias of shifting the equilibrium probably would be minimal. But I'm, I'm sure that is known, but, but I don't remember. I have to check with uh, Yonja. Good, good question. Thank you. Ayush? Yeah, so even, uh, you know, uh, your EM, uh, pictures was not showing so much of difference in the ligand, right? Binding, uh, the ligand look very similar, both the ligands. Yeah, no, actually that's not true. I just chose not to, okay. uh, so, so, so it turns out we can very clearly see what's happening, but for that, I would have to, you know, peer into the molecule, show it to you. I could do that, but at this hour, very early for me and late for you, it's gonna tax uh, you know, our, our visual perception too much, but really I can show you what's happening. So this is the way the ligand binds. 
and there's a movement like this, like um, EGF is a little open, yeah, and TGF uh, TGF alpha is a little closed, and because there's rigidity in the connection here, that you know that results in a swiveling, and okay. that can generate the scissors motion, and we we can we can sort of track all that structurally. We also track it by computer simulation. So I think we do do get that. Uh, it's just more detail than I wanted to share. Great. You know, it's, it's fantastic. It actually sort of adds quite a bit of interesting explanation to many of the genetic experiment over expression of different ligands and versus the receptors. Yeah, it's hard to hard to take all of that in and interpret it correctly, but it's an interesting. I know that's why it, this is much more. Great. Yeah, Thanks. I mean, it's difficult. I mean, but it's just making the point that the general principle, I didn't say this, the general principle of biased agonism was absolutely worked out and understood for GPCRs, that the receptor toggles between states of higher activity and lower activity, and that a particular ligand will tune the set point of where the receptor is. So all of these concepts will work out for GPCR. I would argue that for the receptor tracing kinases, this is, it's not been appreciated that they do that. And, and this work shows that, you know, it's not, it's not, yeah. it's not surprising given GPCRs, but here it is. Yes, yeah, so, uh, shall I just call on people, so Ayush? Yeah, hi, Professor, thank you, it was a great talk. Uh, uh, forgive me if I might have missed out on this explanation bit in your presentation. Uh, but I, I followed how there's different conformational structures that were determined using the whole cryo-EM technique and that there's different levels of activation or expression based on that conformational modification. But sort of if, if you were to trace back, do we have an understanding of the cellular conditions or stressors that are resulting in a specific conformational modification and not another or whether there's any relevance to that um just just uh no so you're really problem. asking if i may paraphrase your question um right. you, you're asking a, a, a deep and therefore difficult question and there are many different levels um at, at which these conformational changes can come into play right for example when the receptor binds the ligand it's internalized and uh, then it goes into endosomes and decisions have to be made about whether uh, it gets heavily ubiquitolated and degraded or less ubiquitolated and recycled. Right. The ubiquitolation in fact depends on the phosphorylation strength of the receptor. So that's a way in which these conformational changes can tap into what the receptor does. Of course, at an even higher level, the organism is deciding in a region of tissue in ways that I don't understand whether it's going to be secreting TGF alpha or EGF or any one of the other ones. And that's going to change. Right. The All right. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Krishna. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for an amazing talk. So, so sorry if this is a little naive. I'm, you know, I would study circuits and behavior. So, uh, but I had a couple of questions. One was um, uh, whether they were constitutively active EGFR mutants and kind of are they interesting to look at structurally? Um, and second, well, one, so actually the answer is yes, and uh, I okay, mentioned sorry, two did of I them. Miss that no, no, that doesn't matter. I think sorry. you know this is a lot of phenomenology, but I want to show you one. I just want to remind you of one because I think this is one where. Um, it, it just right, leads right, to right, so right. much insight, right? And very simple, and actually goes back to the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, work yeah. on VRB is a viral oncogenic form of uh, an EGF receptor yeah. molecule. So the observation you make there is the one on the right, to use your words, is sure. constitutively active. Right. But you've got rid of the extracellular domain. Right. So the insight right. that came right. from this is enormous. Right. And the other one, is the most important, maybe most of two important mutations, most important of two, uh, which I also discussed, which is right, also right, constitutively right. active. It's this mutation right, in the right, kinase right. domain. Yeah, no, these are very, I mean, actually these, both of these are in the clinic. I mean, important in the clinic. So right. you, in glioblastoma and in, in lung cancers. So, you know, it's good, good to be aware of them and understand how they work. Right, right. No, no. I, I, I guess my question was more about whether they were, you know, constitutively active mutants 
that were more interesting from a kind of structural perspective. I mean, these are nice, but they, they seem to be more on the uh, the transmembrane. The, you know, the, the kind oh, of yes. Thing. I didn't and put the, that in for the interest. I didn't put that in. Yeah. So, so, you know, our paper, which is in bioarchive, so it can be read by anybody right. who's interested, right. I, uh, uh, but it's being reviewed at a journal. And you know, reviewing scientific papers is a, is usually hostile comment, sure. right? But there was a reviewer who pointed out to us, "Hey, you know, your stuff is very interesting, yeah. but have you noticed that there are some cancer mutations that lead to constitutive activation of the receptor?" And I should have put that into this talk. And these mutations, they're they're actually fantastic. So if if I show you where these mutations are, so here's the tip separated. And you've heard a whole song and dance about how the tip separator is probably higher activity, okay? And this is the tips together, which are juxtaposed, which is lower activity. And so this reviewer pointed out that there are cancer mutations in this tip. There are two yeah. mutations in this yeah. tip that activate the receptor. And if you look at the model on the left and the model of the right, these mutations, which create hydrophobic residues, which means they're sticky, would be close right. together in the tip separated and, and the mutations would not be located at the same place and the tips juxtaposed. So in other words, the mutations are located beautifully to interact across the dimer in the tip separated form. And really uh, so cool. that may be yeah. an answer yeah. to your question. That, that's a very, uh, that's, you know, that the cancer really has cool. already tested. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. uh, So yeah. I, I think yeah. you have to be careful though, because, um, you know, we are very quick to see correlations and interpret them. You have to get lots yeah. of these correlations before we're sure that we're, right. uh, you know, I mean, our structures are right, but whether the interpretation is right, it'll take time. Yeah, so, yeah, so I have another question. More... Another question. Um, sorry, yeah. sorry. So uh, it was about, uh, you know, uh, about alpha fold. Just wondering what your kind of, if you had any thoughts about kind of alpha fold and because neuroscientists are very excited about what big mind is doing and this kind of using uh, neural networks to pre predict stuff. But I was just wondering if you had any thoughts from somebody who's a real bio, you know, chemist and biochemist. You know, well, I haven't about? been able to assess alpha fold because yeah. I don't understand machine learning. And, sure. uh, you know, clearly we're going to have to change our educational um, uh, mission to in biology uh, to include a lot of machine learning. That's the sure. first conclusion I draw from that. The second conclusion mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, what AlphaFold does in cases like this is, is to give you, um, so, you know, for things that I've looked at, uh, it will uh, give you, yeah, I'll tell you what I think. You know, first of all, it's a very exciting advance. Um, so uh, I, I just can't comment on it because I don't understand sure. machine learning. But what AlphaFold will give you is it'll give you accurately, uh, you know, this structure, this structure, and maybe this structure, right? It'll certainly give you the structures of the components. At the, at the state of development today, it doesn't seem particularly good at um, putting the pieces together. But actually, if you get structures like this, then the physics-based computer simulations that I referred to right. can really move us along. So sure. maybe the bottom line is that in a, a few years, and I don't know how few, developments are mm -hmm. so fast, um, we will not be using cryo-EM or X-ray crystallography to determine primary structures that maybe will be determined computationally. But we'll be using it in the way that I'm showing you here, where we're yeah. you know, trying to figure out nuances where you really want the direct image. Right. Maybe the computer simulation would also tell you that's what you're going to see. Right. Yeah. Thank so you. It was great, a really, uh, really amazing talk. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate thank it. You. And I appreciate the thank questions. You. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Gaia 3. Hi. So if uh, so, if I understand right, the L eight thirty nine mutant is in the cytoplasmic domain. It's in the kinase yes. domain. Yeah. So when it uh, stabilizes the tip of the extracellular domain, how does it communicate? And I'm surprised that the transmembrane helix is not uh, ordered. 
during this um, uh, no it is it is so i think the very important thing so this to, to, just let me just deal with the, the second part of the question correctly uh, first uh, the way i would think about it is the is the kinase domain is ordered the transmembrane helix is ordered and the extracellular domain is ordered okay i mean different states but they're all ordered so the question is, why do we only see the extracellular domain? That has to do with a purely technical aspect of cryo-EM. Um, but I'll go back to the photography analogy. So imagine you have a photograph of a person waving his arms, and you have hundreds of these photographs. And in each one, the arm is in a, a different conformation, and you do need to average many images to get high-resolution detail. Now, um, the way you would do that is you would take each picture, find the arm and keep it, and then take the next picture, find the arm and align the arm, and you would do that, and then you get a high resolution picture of the arm. So given the current state of development of cryoEM, small pieces like this and this are simply not detected by the computer algorithms and the initial images, so they can't be aligned. But that's a technical problem, and it may just disappear in the next few years, if you see what I mean. Hmm. Did, did I answer the question? Yeah, so my uh, doubt was, like, when L1839 in the cytoplasmic domain is able to order the tip at the other end, should the path between, shouldn't the path between them also be ordered? So this flexibility... So what I'm saying is, I would say box. yes. I would say yes, they should be ordered. But things can be ordered, but not segmentally fixed. That's one problem. Okay. The okay. second problem is even if the transmembrane and the kinase domains are perfectly ordered, they're at the limit of what the EM algorithms can detect in order to align an average. Okay. Okay, so that's a technical, that's not a fundamental problem. It's a technical problem. And finally, this connection is clearly you know, transmitting information Hmm. But it's flexible in the sense that the uh, receptor can bend. And, and that's why we're not getting, once we align the extracellular domain, we're not imaging the transmembrane and kinase domains. Okay, thank you. So, uh, John, I have a clarification to ask us when you're talking about L8C4R mutation, when you say it's constantly active. It's still ligand dependent, right? Based on the structure analysis. Yes, so actually that's correct. It's just that LA34, so there are different kinds of mutations. Um, you know, all of this is an equilibrium and LA34R is definitely active. So you'll see phosphorylation without adding EGF, but it is yeah, stimulatable. Part, yeah. Yeah, that, uh, so um, I'm just wondering whether it's, uh, you know, the uh, ligand is once binds uh, to the receptor, receptor gets activated, but it is not getting back to the original state. So ligand is sort of stuck. Is that what a possibility? So that if, why it is constitutively active, it is still dependent on the ligand. Uh, no, I don't think of it that way. I just think of it as equilibrium. You know, like if there's no ligand, it's like 10, uh, 10 active, 90 percent inactive. If you add the ligand, it goes to 50-50. Oh. And if you add the mutation, um, it goes to like 90, 10, the other way. So I, I just see it as an equilibrium process. Thanks. So, uh, John, I had a question about these uh, receptor tyrosine kinases. Are, are these, are the extracellular domains always uh, homodimeric or are there examples of heterodimers as well? Oh, oh no, no. There, there are many that are heterodimers. And in fact, with the I don't want to go into these details, but in fact, the logic of the EGF receptor family is based on heterodimerization. So there are four members, which are called HER1 or EGF receptor, HER2, HER3, HER4, for human epidermal growth factor receptor. And the most potent signaling combinations are heterodimers. And that's a whole interesting story about why that is and the logic, but that's like a whole different lecture. But yes, heterodimers are very, very important.
Okay, well, I don't see any other hands. Well, here's your last chance, folks, if you have a question to ask. Uh, oh, if not, uh, well, thank you again, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, very interesting, very exciting talk. Uh, thank you for sparing the time and uh, for getting up early for this. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, for this bye -bye. great lecture. And I hope in your future visits to India, you'll be able to hopefully situation. Yeah, I was disappointed better. when I got invited to give yeah. this talk. I, 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 of course, I totally understand. I totally understand. Mm -hmm. But I, I was thinking maybe I would do it in person, which is always uh, nicer. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I totally understand the camp campus is closed. We at Berkeley, we're fully open now, but I hope that oh, the really? situation okay. won't, yeah, this, I hope the situation won't change so that we have to also close down because I think we yeah, lost, yeah. we lost an enormous amount of human, uh, very valuable human interaction over the last uh, year and a half. You are absolutely right in every aspect, not just in educational institution, even in businesses. I see it, you know, the creativity, innovation is suffering because of that. Zoom, Zoom calls can only go so far. They're very and effective, hopefully but, but they go online. only so far, yeah. So I look forward to an in-person visit uh, at the earliest yes, opportunity. Maybe, be, maybe in good. December, when do, you, when do you think you'll open? Or it's un yeah, hard to yeah. predict? Yeah, you see that now they are talking about some mild, uh, uh, another in you know, another uh, you know version of uh, in, in the winter you know but I don't know but, but the scientific community is kind of divided I guess hopefully it will be because Indi people in India are getting vaccinated now at a higher pace hopefully the situation will be better and uh, you know, it won't be that bad but I you know it's tough to predict all that because the virus is still mutating. And uh, so in Ashoka, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, PhD Shahid, students Shahid in the lab. A real, uh, uh, you know, oh, Shahid, what's your view since you are in the middle of all this and you have been involved in media uh, uh, so much? Well, we are so still you getting, we are still getting huh? uh, about 40,000 cases a day. Yeah, so, and the vaccination rate is is still not very high, but actually the new zero survey that came out shows that the exposure rates are fairly high. So about two thirds of India has already been exposed. If you believe. Oh, okay. The so the herd immunity. Has been well, herd immunity is still a bit farther, but nevertheless. Let me so, ask you: all the forty thousand number a day. Is that in context to India's population, 1.3 billion plus? Uh, well, yeah. Is that a, still a bad number? Well, uh, it's certainly much better, but we prefer it to be zero. Uh, and yeah. you know, there, will be a, there will be a time when it will be, but just not yet. But yeah, I think campuses so, uh, uh, can open with regular testing. And, uh, you know, with, uh, yes, yes. In fact, we have, uh, you know, PhD students have been working with, with, uh, in a, with some rotation, but now we are allowing more and more PhD students work at the same time in the same lab. Uh, okay. So otherwise, they were supposed to alternate. Someone, some people. But, but you can't. Down, you know, I mean, you can't have a lecture. I mean, I'd imagine you cannot yeah. have a lecture with no, people that's sitting yeah. close together. So that's yeah. what we have to wait. Hopefully, by uh, September, October, we will open that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll be okay. in touch. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. Thanks again, John. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, John. You. Bye. Wonderful. Bye. Bye. Bye.